Laura Crusilla, and I'm a researcher at the University of Oslo. This is a video on infinity in mathematics, and infinity in mathematics is a topic of my research grant sponsored by the Horizon 2020 program of the European Union. This is the second of a series of videos on philosophical aspects of infinity in mathematics. In our first video, we introduced infinity by using a thought experiment and then looked at three well-known paradoxes of the infinite, the paradox of Achilles and the tortoise, the paradox that goes under the name of Hilbert's Hotel, and Galileo's paradox. These paradoxes highlighted the difficulties we face as finite beings in understanding the infinite. In this video, we look at profound changes that took place over the centuries in our understanding of uh, infinity. So we start by looking at Aristotle's distinction between potential and actual infinity, and then look at uh, the changes which took place in, around the, especially around the 19th century, and uh, in particular, Cantorian infinity. Let's start then by where we left uh, the topic last time. So uh, last time we looked at paradoxes. So it's uh, helpful to remind ourselves of what a paradox is. A paradox is a statement or a series of statements which together with apparently true premises and by seemingly uncontroversial reasoning forces us to reach false or absurd conclusions. Last time, we started by looking at the paradox of Achilles and the tortoise. This paradox was, is usually attributed to Zeno of Ilia, 5th century BC. It was introduced for philosophical reasons, to, uh, mainly to argue against motion, but is also often thought to be a paradox uh, of uh, the infinite, a paradox in particular which uh, strains our idea of uh, the infinite as, or, or say a finite, uh, for example, a finite line as infinitely divisible. So uh, just to very briefly remind ourselves of what happened with uh, this paradox, the idea is that we have Achilles and the tortoise, the tortoise starts ahead of Achilles, and um, the two uh, uh, compete in a race, but the idea is that um, even if Achilles is much faster than the tortoise, however fast he goes, he will uh, uh, always try to catch up uh, the tortoise, but by the time he manages to uh, reach where the tortoise was one instant ago, the tortoise will have gone a little bit further on. So the idea is that uh, the paradox suggests that Achilles will never reach uh, the uh, tortoise and the tortoise will uh, win the race. So we said last time, this is one of the paradoxes which strain, which show the strain that infinity uh, puts to our understanding and the difficulty we face when we uh, uh, move from a view of, um, the, which, of, for example, in this case, uh, distances, which uh, is uh, based on uh, a finitary um, uh, approach to one in which we consider uh, a distance as uh, infinite. In this case, uh, we think of a distance as composed of infinitely many uh, stopping points. So what, what I want to see now is how uh, Aristotle uh, answered to this uh, uh, the challenge that uh, this paradox uh, poses to our understanding of infinity. So Aristotle uh, distinguished the, the famous uh, Greek uh, philosopher introduced a distinction between potential and actual infinity. And he argued that essentially the infinite exists potentially, but not actually. So by in introducing the distinction and claiming that only uh, potential infinity is legitimate, Aristotle could give a good uh, answer, uh, philosoph a philosophical answer to uh, the uh, paradox of Achilles and the tortoise, among others. 
But let's see uh, how we can uh, make some sense of this distinction. This is a difficult, complex distinction, so I'll try to give the, the intuition behind, behind it um, in uh, the simplest possible terms. So one way to uh, express this uh, distinction between potential and actual infinity is by highlighting the idea that put the potential infinite is that which can, give, be, can be given through a process. So the idea is the key to the potential infinite is a process which generates always more. So in particular, if you think of an infinite collection, an infinite collection is thought in terms, uh, in, in, as a potentially infinite collection, when we think of it as uh, one to which we can always add new elements. Or new things. Last time, uh, when we uh, in the in the first video, we um, looked at uh, a way um, of thinking of infinity, which was suggested by Hermann Weyl in his uh, booklet from nineteen eighteen, the booklet called Das Continuum. Hermann Weyl argues that the essence of the infinite is inexhaustibility. So this idea of the infinite as inexhaustible, that which cannot be exhausted, uh, is very much in agreement with this uh, Aristotelian idea of the infinite as potential. So uh, Aristotle distinguished this view of infinity, which for Aristotle was the legitimate way, the only legitimate way of thinking of uh, infinity, from uh, another notion, another way of looking at infinity. And that uh, is a view of that uh, sees the infinite as uh, actual. So often this uh, idea of actual of the actual infinite uh, is expressed in terms of uh, a completion. So if you think of uh, the infinite as given through a process, you could think of this process as somehow reach, having reached completion. So another way of uh, looking at uh, this idea of the actual infinite is by thinking of uh, an actually infinite collection as one that is finished or completed. So some people also think of this in terms of, I think, for example, Hermann Weyl himself uh, would uh, express this by saying, OK, you, you, if you think of uh, an infinite as uh, actual, is as if you had in front of you, in a sense, uh, the whole uh, infinite set, and you could survey it and see it, uh, see each um, element of this uh, infinite collection. So you see the, the difference is, one is the view of potential infinite as never completed and all is, uh, in a sense, the a finite, uh, the, the, the idea of a potential infinite is the, the idea of something which is finite and can be which can be always extended. And the idea of the actual infinite, where you think of something which is infinite as actually being there and simultaneously available to you. Indeed, this idea of simultaneously available to you is the one that uh, more in, uh, in the book The Infinite, uh, thinks is uh, perhaps the best way to uh, characterize this distinction. So uh, Moore writes the actual infinite is that whose infinitude exists or is given at some point in time. The potential infinite is that whose infinitude exists or is given over time. It is never wholly present. So that's uh, another way of uh, bringing forward this uh, rather uh, tricky or complex distinction between action and potential infinity. So the thought is that uh, once uh, Aristotle introduced this distinction, it could give a reply to paradoxes like uh, Zeno's by claiming that uh, the paradox uh, and the difficulties we experience with this paradox arises if we take the say the distance between the starting point of the race and the end of the race as actually as an actual infinitude uh, of uh, points so or stop, possible stopping points so if you think of this distinct the, this uh, distance between the beginning and the end of the race as made of infinitely many stopping points 
And the, if you think of them as completed, available to you, actually infinity, then the paradox arises. But the paradox does not uh, uh, arise if you think of this purely in terms of potential infinity. And for Aristotle, as we saw, only potential infinity is legitimate. So the, the actual infinity is the one which instead uh, gives rise to the troubles we have when thinking of infinity. Okay, so that's uh, what say the, the a way of um, um, simplifying quite a lot, but a way of uh, trying to capture this distinction uh, between potential action and infinity. What is important to stress is that traditional approaches to infinity, both in philosophy, but here we are in particularly interested in the case of mathematics. Um, so. Typical, traditional approaches to infinity in mathematics typically follow Aristotle and the, the, the mathematicians for, uh, say, centuries, uh, indeed millennia, uh, took uh, the infinite to be potential rather than actual. So they thought that the only uh, legitimate notion of, of infinity was that of potential infinity. So the mathematical infinity is merely potential for uh, many, uh, for, for, say, many, many centuries. Uh, this view is very well expressed by a, a quotation by uh, Carl Friedrich Gauss, a very, very well-known mathematician. This is a quotation which is often uh, um, uh, presented when talking about uh, infinity. So Gauss wrote, uh, I protest against the use of an infinite quantity as something completed, which is never permissible in mathematics. So this idea is that the only uh, legitimate notion of infinity is that of potential infinity, not uh, actual infinity. So things changed, however. So this the Gauss is, uh, uh, you see, um, um, in between the 18th and 19th century. So throughout the 19th century, uh, mathematics underwent very fundamental changes. And among these changes is also the, a change to the way, way mathematicians thought of the infinite. So uh, these uh, changes were um, uh, very, very um, uh, striking and uh, so much so that um, a number of, of uh, scholars have highlighted that perhaps uh, the uh, most uh, one of the best known uh, characterizations is that by Howard Stein, who writes uh, in a very influential article from 1988, writes that uh, mathematics uh, underwent a transformation so profound that it is not too much to call it a second birth of the subject. Its first birth having occurred among the ancient Greeks. So, and this, uh, Howard Stein stresses that we are talking about the same uh, subject, hmm? but uh, this subject, in a sense, has a new birth in the 19th century. So the changes are uh, to a number of, uh, uh, in, in a number of contexts. So one, for example, important change is that Mathematics uh, was before often uh, so new 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 discoveries in mathematics were often prompted by um, problems that need to be solved. For example, prompted by mechanics. But with time, mathematics becomes much more independent, and you have the emergence of what now today we call pure mathematics. Mathematics uh, problems arise. Uh, by just uh, through within mathematics, not prompted by, uh, say, uh, other disciplines like uh, mechanics or physics. And um, other changes, one a very important one is the role of algebra, algebraic way of thinking in mathematics, and many others. But the uh, point which uh, interests us most uh, now is a change in the way people start thinking about infinity. So it is indeed one of the most significant changes. Uh, so the, the thought is that slowly the actual infinite makes its way through mathematics and becomes a legitimate notion. And this is especially, um, uh, this happens especially uh, through the work of a mathematician, Georg Cantor, and um, especially because of his um, uh, 
is, is uh, say, uh, work in what is uh, called set theory. So we are going now to look a little bit at some key points of uh, Cantor's set theory and um, to highlight uh, the role of um, the actual infinite there. So before doing that, in order to do that, let's say, uh, let's give, uh, a, a, say, a, um, an intuition what uh, sets uh, are. So we are going to talk about set theory. So it's uh, um, useful to have uh, an idea, what, what often are called naive sets. Hmm? So the idea is that uh, what, what is a set essentially is a way of grouping together things which are similar in some respects. So we often group together, for example, people or objects, if they satisfy a common property or a common characteristics. For example, we could talk about all of Paul's best friends. We could talk of the eggs in my refrigerator, to use an important philosophical example. And we can talk instead of the whole numbers less than 12. So these are all different ways of putting together a fi finite number of things and getting, and, and the idea is that we can think of, uh, for example, Paul's best friends, not just as uh, individual people, but also as a group. And this whole thing, uh, we think of that as a set. And the same, for example, the whole numbers less than 12, we can think of them not just as the number one, number two, number three, and so on, but as a group, a whole thing, and that is a set of all the numbers less than 12. So we consider these objects as forming a whole, and these, so the objects plus, uh, together with this idea of a whole, in a sense, is what makes the idea of a set. So this is the idea. So uh, then with time, one, uh, one uh, came up with more sophisticated notions of sets. We see next, uh, with the next video, one reason for doing that. Uh, so if one takes, uh, a very naive notion of set, one can uh, get uh, into troubles, one can give rise to paradoxes again. But uh, uh, the, the idea is that provided you are a little bit careful, you can give a nice, uh, very useful notion of set. And this notion can play an important role in uh, mathematics. And this is what indeed uh, Georg Cantor realized. So Georg Cantor was a German mathematician, uh, from uh, born in 1845, and um, he uh, is usually considered the father of set theory, the one who uh, gave rise to, uh, who invented, uh, say, set theory. But the point we are particularly interested in uh, today is the fact that his work was fundamental for the acceptance within mathematics of the uh, actual infinity. So the idea is that these uh, sets that Cantor considered were not just sets as the one in the previous slides, which were just, uh, before we looked at very small sets, um, or finite, but he considered also infinite sets. And indeed, uh, Cantor showed not only that uh, there are infinite, because uh, not only infinite sets, but he also showed that there are different kinds of infinities and in fact, infinitely many infinities. So uh, one of the main uh, concepts uh, Cantor introduced is a concept of what he called transfinite numbers. These are numbers which are uh, infinite, uh, and in particular, he introduced the notion of infinite cardinal and infinite ordinal numbers. So I won't be uh, going into this uh, in this video, but these are very important notions in set theory, which uh, uh, Cantor um, introduced. And, and really, the, this introdu the introduction of these notions open up a new field, a totally new field in mathematics, which is today an important fundamental field. So just to give a quick idea of uh, this um, way of looking at the infinity that uh, Cantor um, came up with. Um, they, uh, the Cantor, as I said in the previous slide, uh, not only uh, realized, say, the importance of infinite sets, but he also 
uh, uh, realize that there are different kinds of infinity. So in order to be able to talk of different kinds of infinity, we need to be able to measure uh, the infinite. And that's what uh, Cantor did. So in the previous video, we looked at what goes under the name of Galileo's paradox. So Galileo's paradox arises because we uh, compare the whole numbers, one, two, three, four, five, and so on, with so-called square numbers, numbers which are the square of one uh, whole number. For example, number so in particular, the number 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, and so on. And the thought, that, uh, the, the observation that Galileo made was that it would look like uh, we should uh, think of the square numbers as certainly less in number than uh, the whole number. So because uh, between the number one and the number four, you have, so if you take the number one and the number four, you have uh, the number two and the number three. So it looks like, and between the number four and the number nine, huh, you have five, six, seven, and eight. So it looks like uh, the, 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 there are certainly uh, more whole numbers than um, square numbers. But, uh, so uh, Galileo realized, well, uh, that, uh, what is very puzzling is the fact that, in, uh, however, we, we can pair uh, square numbers and whole numbers, so uh, we can just enumerate all the uh, square numbers. And so we, we can take the first, which is one, the second, which is four, the third, which is nine, and so on. And however we go on with more uh, of, uh, whole numbers, sorry, uh, uh, we always will find a new uh, square number because we have infinitely many. So the fact that we have an infinitely um, expanding uh, uh, collection of uh, square numbers allows us to always find new ones, uh, which... Uh, therefore uh, ensures that we can pair uh, the uh, whole numbers with the square numbers. And this, uh, we saw Galileo uh, thought uh, shows, so for Galileo, this thought, um, shows that our usual way of thinking of uh, uh, measure, measurements in um, the, the sort of measuring uh, ideas that we have for the finitary context doesn't work anymore in the case of the infinite. So we have to change a way of thinking, of measuring. Huh? And, and, and that's where, uh, say, Galileo's consideration stopped. So what uh, Cantor did is to think of this um, idea of pairing uh, whole numbers with squares hmm, as a way of measuring uh, the infinite. So the idea is in essentially that because you can... Uh, pair the uh, whole numbers with the squares, uh, you can indeed show that the whole number and the square are have the same sides. They are, uh, there is no distinction when it comes to sides between these, uh, these, these numbers. So the, the impression that we have that indeed the um, uh, square should be less than the whole numbers is not uh, correct. Uh, what the uh, pairing that we can think of between uh, whole numbers and squares shows us is that indeed we, these uh, two collections, two infinite collections, have the same sides. So the idea is, is that, to use the mathematical mm, terminology, we, we can think of the whole numbers and the square as in one-to-one -one correspondence, and this one-to-one -one correspondence can be used as a way of measuring infinite sets. Mm -hmm. And this in particular tells us that squares and whole numbers have the same sides. So this is, in a sense, is a wonderful idea. So this idea uh, allows you to measure and compare different kinds of infinity. And what is uh, 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 important about uh, uh, Cantor is that not only he proposed this method for comparing the sides of infinite sets, but he also showed to give a mathematical proof that some infinite sets are larger than others. So we saw the squares and the uh, whole numbers have the same sides, taking this way of measuring uh, infinite sets. Um, however, there are some uh, sets which are bigger than the whole numbers. 
And these are, uh, for example, the real numbers. So Kant proved uh, with a beautiful proof, uh, which is, uh, uses what is uh, called, a, uh, at least in one, one of the proofs that Kant gave, it uses what is called the diagonal method. Uh, it showed that uh, the real numbers are strictly more than the natural numbers. So uh, the natural numbers or, 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 or the whole numbers are the one we saw also last time, one, two, three, four, and so on. Uh, the real numbers are mm, the numbers, all the ones, all the natural numbers, but also fractions, for example, uh, a half or 0 0.5. The uh, decimal numbers like 3.14 and also the number pi and so on. So the uh, proof that Cantor gave, which is uh, beautiful, I invite you to have a look. There are many representations of this online. Uh, uh, is that uh, shows that indeed there are more real numbers than natural numbers. So the infinity, there is not just one infinity, there are many forms of infinity in the sense there are infinities of different sides. And when you start having two kinds of them indeed, uh, you easily show that there are infinitely many infinities. Okay, so... Uh, one word with regard to the reception of Kant's wonderful and uh, revolutionary ideas uh, at the time when uh, of uh, uh, his um, say uh, at his time, so uh, Kant's ideas faced uh, stark opposition by many of his contemporaries. For example, a very influential mathematician of the time, um, uh, the Leopold Kronecker, was uh, the. Um, say, the, one of the most prominent mathematicians uh, in Berlin, um, uh, was not, uh, was very critical of, it, of uh, Cantor's ideas. And indeed, many uh, commentators think the, the hostile attitude uh, of many of Cantor's contemporaries towards uh, his work uh, had a very negative impact on uh, Cantor's own health. And, and so this, um, this is, uh, say, um, an interesting uh, um, part of a, a, an important part of a, say, history of, uh, um, of mathematics. Uh, and what is important to observe, however, is that even if at that point, at the time, there was uh, uh, opposition to these uh, ideas, so much so that some uh, mat mathematicians um, for the indeed uh, Cantor was at least 100 years uh, ahead of his time. Um, the, some other uh, mathematicians, uh, typically younger ones, a little bit uh, in, in a different generation, uh, were much more ready to accept uh, Cantor's ideas. So as other younger mathematicians indeed embraced Cantor's new mathematics of the infant, praised that, and with time, uh, Cantor's ideas were uh, very much accepted. Um, so, for example, one of the most uh, important um, uh, mathematicians who strongly um, uh, supported Cantor's ideas is uh, David Hilbert, uh, who, for example, called uh, Cantor's set theory um, uh, Cantor's paradise, and, and he claimed that no one should take the Cantor's paradise from us. We should... Uh, uh, we should uh, say cherish all these uh, wonderful uh, mathematics. I'll say a little bit more about Hilbert uh, in a, a subsequent video. Um, so for today, uh, it's uh, enough just to say that today Cantorian set theory is widely taken to offer a, 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 an important part of mathematics and indeed is often thought also to uh, offer a foundation for mathematics uh, which um, is important, not just mathematically, but also from a philosophical perspective. And there is indeed uh, also fundamental uh, uh, um, work in uh, mathematics itself. So there is um, the area of set theory, where um, uh, set theorists uh, today st study stronger and stronger infinitary assumptions, what uh, goes under the name of uh, large cardinals, and these are uh, often referred to as the higher infinite. So there is, there is a whole uh, area of mathematics which was uh, somehow um, 
introduced to us by uh, these uh, very uh, lungimerant uh, views by uh, Georg Cantor and is an important uh, subject uh, in mathematics today. In a subsequent video, I will look at uh, um, a different way of looking at infinity, which is uh, critical of uh, Cantorian's views and argue that both the Cantorian and, uh, and also the critical view of infinity, both of them are uh, very uh, profitable. So it's important to look at both the Cantorian view and its uh, criticism and realize that both of them give rise to important forms uh, of mathematics. Okay, let's uh, conclude uh, with this um, uh, video. So in this video, we have seen um, uh, Aristotle's distinction between actual and potential infinity. And we also mentioned uh, Cantorian set theory and the uh, notion of uh, infinity, which arises within that. Cantorian uh, set theory demonstrates a striking change of attitude towards infinity that took place over time and matured especially, became uh, dominant especially during the 19th century. This uh, uh, change uh, was uh, fundamental and gave rise to important new mathematics. It also gave rise to new uh, uh, troubles, in a sense, new uh, uh, difficulties. And we will see next time uh, in the next video um, Russ's paradox and uh, some of its consequences. So we saw some paradoxes of the infinite. We saw one way of uh, overcoming them uh, through Aristotelian's ideas. We saw that mathematicians move on uh, from Aristot the Aristotelian ideas and slowly came to accept a notion of actual infinity. We see that um, some care needs to be taken when we develop uh, uh, those uh, Cantorian ideas uh, to avoid uh, getting back into some form of paradox. And that will be the topic of the next video.